Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Berta, my co host, Michael Bird. As a business and healthcare law firm, we meet many interesting people in various stages of their business. Yes. This season, we get to focus on the high stakes implications of selling a business. Brad, this season's theme is the Hitchhiker's Guide to M&A. We will be guest heavy and bring in different professionals to offer their experiences and perspectives in M&A. Yes, and for those who don't know, M&A is a, uh, it's abbreviations for mergers and acquisitions, which if those who don't know what that means, it's for the buying and selling of a business, the buying and selling of substantially all the assets of the business. Michael, I'm going to ask you a really tough question here as we get going. Um, did you graduate from law school? Okay, well, this is a setup. Yes, I'll, I'll humor you, Brad. Yes, Brad, I graduated from law school. This is what allows me to be a lawyer and it allows me to be your partner. Okay, did you get your law degree from maybe Palm Beach School of Law in Florida? No, but that does sound really nice. I went to Texas Tech, and there was definitely no beach anywhere <laughs> in the name of the law school or anywhere near the law school. Well, and for those watching on the YouTube channel, our guest did have his guns up, which is a Texas Tech thing, which we'll get into the guest in a second. Well, <laughs> we're just checking, um, and I, I want to make sure you did have that law degree because a scandal has broke a few weeks ago where medical and nursing licensing officials across multiple states are scrambling to stop nurses with broadened academic credentials from caring for patients. It appears that in Florida, there were three schools accused of selling these bogus nursing diplomas. And according to prosecutors, o over 7,000 students paid an average of about $15,000 for a nursing diploma. Was one of these three schools, this Palm Beach school you were setting me up? About? It was, that's why I should make oh. sure you weren't getting get it from the law school there. And, and, and these certificates allowed them to sit down even though they weren't trained in anything, to um, sit for the National Nursing Board exams. And of these 7,000 people, almost 3,000 of them actually passed their exams. That's crazy. Yeah. Pretty unsettling because these fake nurses were working all across the country. They're working in nursing homes with, pedi with pediatrics, with a VA. I mean, the VA has so far has fired at least almost 90 nurses right now. And now state licensing boards are scrambling all across the country. I mean, they're talking about all the way from Washington State to New York City, even down here in Texas, where they're all just trying to figure out how to get rid of these bogus nurses. That, that is uh, absolutely crazy. And uh, you were setting me up, Brad. You wanted me to be that fake lawyer. I was just making sure. I mean, okay. sometimes a little wondering about you. But all this started with this federal investigation. You got to love federal investigation. They come up with like the funniest terms, but Operation Nightingale. And where the Justice Department um, fired, I mean, fired, yeah, unsealed the current criminal conspiracy where they say there was wire fraud, wire, I mean, I can't talk to any people, wire fraud charges with against 25 people who were taking these money for, for these fake diplomas. And now, and now these, uh, these Southern Florida nursing schools are all been closed. Yeah, your, your talking ability in that last little bit, Brad, <laughs> raises the question of whether you went to the South Beach Law School. <laughs> I did not go there for communications. Palm Beach Law School. <laughs> okay. Well, what does this any of this have to do with today's guest? I, I, I know our guest personally, and I'm pretty sure he's not a nurse, nor has he ever claimed to be a nurse. I, yeah, I don't think so either. Um, I, I don't – well, our, today's guest has done a ton of dental and medical m &A deals. And he's generally focused on the numbers. And when I was preparing for today's show, I kept thinking about this reminds me of when we're working on, on, on all aspects of an M&A deal, you really start focusing on different aspects of that practice itself. And then I started thinking like, okay, as you're buying these practices, selling practices, are the people actually working there having the actual licenses? And is someone actually you know, going through that process? Yeah, that would be a real bummer if you were a buyer and bought a practice that had some of these fake nurses yes, in right. there. Well, yes, Brad, having employees that actually are trained to provide the service, I would say, is essential, especially if you're treating people. <laughs> uh, but let's move on. Let's bring on our guest today. We have Mike White joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, surprise, surprise again. We have a friend and uh, someone we've known for a really long time. Mike is a CPA with CLA, Clifton Larson Allen. He has double degrees from Texas Tech University, Rawls College of Business, and uh, guns up again. <laughs> uh, 
B, he has a BA in accounting and business management and a master's degree in accounting. He spent the majority of his career in public accounting, helping entrepreneurs, um, and he's worked with many different industries, including lawyers, consultants, um, marketing and media companies, and uh, what we'll really explore today, he's worked a lot with DSOs and MSOs, along with individual dental and physician clients. Mike, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. And we could probably have a whole session just on the nursing discussion because I think there's a shortfall of about 650,000 they're expecting over the next decade. Um, so, yes, definitely a lot going on. And, and go Texas Tech for <laughs> our fellow Red Raiders. And there is not a beach out there, uh, but miss it some days, miss it some days. So, thanks for having me. Well, Mike, we're happy to have you. And as you know, this, our theme for this season is the Hitchhiker's Guide to MA. And um, before we really, really dive too deep into, um, into the day's show, I guess the, the question that we all want to know now is now, did you attempt to get a nursing degree from my Florida school by chance? No, no. I actually went into accounting because I realized it wasn't that smart in science, so <laughs> would not have gone very well. But, but there's, but you could have just gotten one. Though. We could have just, well, there was a dateline about a gentleman who bought a doctor's license in oh, Florida. God. So it's uh, apparently prevalent down there in Florida. Okay. Well, for audience members, they know that my partner, Michael Bird, who actually has a law license, we established that, he loves context. And because he loves context so much, before we kind of dive deeper into it, today's episode with, uh, with Mike, Michael, why don't we talk about, you know, the seasons of business and really focusing on the five phases of an M&A deal? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the key to understanding that in an M&A deal, it is completely set up by your business and how it's navigated these various seasons, every business is in, you know, one of four seasons, we have the building season, we have the operating season, we have the scaling season, and then finally the buying and selling season. Mm -hmm. And as you just mentioned, we're camping out on the buying and selling season uh, this season and in this episode with Mike. And then we talk about in that season, if you're doing an M&A deal, kind of what does that timeline look at? We call it the five phases. We have the letter of intent, mm -hmm. then we have the due diligence that happens, the underwear drawer moment that you mm -hmm. mentioned so much. And then we get into the where the lawyers get to shine with the definitive agreements and the negotiations. And then we have a close. And then what people don't realize is after the close, there's usually cleanup work to do that we call post closing, which our clients all hate. Yeah. Well, that's perfect. Thank you for giving context, audience members. Um, and so, Michael, since we've established you're not a nurse, um, let's talk about your story. What drove you to the accounting world besides the fact not wanting to be a nurse and, and especially with the focus, it was unique on, on, on dental and medical. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a weird CPA and I, I use that loosely as I married a CPA as well, but not traditional in so many ways. I mean, I started a CPA firm when I was 25 years old and it really just started with a passion of helping small business owners. And, and we've, we've known each other a long time. So we share that passion. And as we started helping small business owners, you start getting niches and, and some more experiences in various areas. And since about 2009, 2010, I had acquired a 62 year old healthcare consulting firm that just drove me right into uh, healthcare. And I had a partner at the time that did everything non healthcare, and it was uh, it was great. So we we kept growing that firm, and really, and I know we're going to get into the evolution of the industries. Really, we we grew up with especially the evolution of dental. Mm -hmm. We had already seen some of that evolution in the physician world. Uh, happen so you could use that as a baseline and now we look at that with eye care and med spa and all the other worlds that we live in today um, and it's exciting to see and it's exciting to be a part of it but it came back to the fundamentals of why we wanted to do this is there is a lot of tremendous cpa firms out there but as a cpa you're trained to do a task and a deadline tax returns financial statement audit and there's a business to run 365 days a year Mm -hmm. And we really made that passion to plug those non-deadline times to help educate the business owners. Here's what an income statement is, providing context to the financial statements, to the tax returns, and how all that really impacted them day to day. And as we got to know the business more and more, we really got into the drivers, key mm -hmm. performance indicators, as we call them. So all of those things helped drive a better financial story, which we'll talk about a little bit here as well. But that's our passion. And now I, I get to be in the M&A space a lot. I've done about 300 transactions in the last 18 months. And, you know, I spend a lot of time there. So good to see you guys a lot, too. Yes, that's awesome. Well, um, we're going to 
camp out a little bit on dental focus questions, but I'd love before we go there, just talk a little bit about the range of uh, kind of particularly in the healthcare world of uh, clients that you serve in you know, dental, medical, et cetera. Yeah, so we, we serve everything from solo practices to the largest dental group in, in the nation. And, you know, what, what we find there is we've actually found inflection points. And I bet in the legal sense, you guys have seen the same. So we call it one to three locations. And I'm going to define a location. Again, now that I know context is so important, <laughs> um, about one to five million in revenue, five to 20 million in revenue and 20 million and up. And we found those inflection points because they're critical, as you know. You know, at three locations or five million in revenue, they're, they're starting to get out of the chair. Mm -hmm. They're starting to have to be a business owner. They're starting to look at those legal documents a little more importantly, possibly defining a management service organization or a management company or a dental service organization. At 1520, their accounting is supposed to be getting more sophisticated. Not saying it wasn't important before that, but that's where we really start yeah. getting those calls. And, you know, in 20 million and up, you have private equity pretty much, you know, at your door on a day-to-day -day basis. So, right. you know, we, we really love those emerging groups, the one to 20, one to 15. We can serve them in a lot of ways. We can provide a lot of fractional services. We have a team of former CFOs and CFO, COOs of DSOs and MSOs all over the nation. So that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, so, and, and just real quick context for the audience, when we use the word DSO and MSO, we're talking about management service organizations or dental support organizations, we could do uh, an entire episode just on that structure. But it's essentially how, you know, private non-physicians or non-dentists get into this space. And so it's really prevalent. And that, that kind of leads me into my next question, which is you were there uh, in the dental market, you know, way back when you mentioned, you know, as far back as that's 2010 and things were really starting to emerge at that time. Talk a little bit about how the dental market has evolved, uh, you know, and changed over the last 10 years or so. Well, well first we, we've grown up together. So the term way back is really starting to date us. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I guess that is, it's a true statement now, right? We've seen a few decades together. So, you know, when we got into this industry in that time, you know, there were group organizations. You know, DSO really wasn't a big term used. You saw a lot of combined groups. You saw a lot of management companies. And of course, the DSO or MSO um, was certainly a naughty word, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's things that provided an ugly context to, to individuals and doctors in the profession. It was, there was a, I don't want to say it was in a fight, but it was an internal inflection that you saw quite a bit. And ultimately, you had groups and practices that found a model that was successful. And you had that entrepreneurial spirit that says, you know, if I did this once, uh, why not do it again? Mm -hmm. And quickly, one turned to three, three turned to 20. And now you have dental groups, you know, over a thousand plus locations all over the world and consolidation happening across borders. And and you still only have a third of America going to the dentist on a regular basis. So there's still a lot of upside and potential is what you see. Yeah. But, you know, at that time, if we look back 10, 15, you know, years, we may have been, and there's not great data, but we may have been 5% consolidated when I first came into the industry and when I mean consolidated is mean combined groups. I'm not going to say fully defined DSO. I'm just mm -hmm. saying groups today. The number is probably 30 to 35%. Again, not great data, but this is just keeping a pulse of the industry and talking to a lot of folks like yourself to kind of opine where, where we are today. So we've seen a lot of change. Interesting. And, and for our guests, we're going to go into a deeper dive in the second half of, of this on the, on the legal side, really talking about, why, from a legal perspective, you might need an MSO or a DSO when you have the, the court practice of medicine, the court practice of dentistry. So we won't dive too hard on this part of it. But, you know, if you're a dentist or a physician, why would you even consider um, selling or being a, selling yourself to an MSO or to a DSO? Yeah. And, and I'm going to love Michael here from a context standpoint, you know, uh, and funny story, Michael, you know, my partner, Eddie, or my former partner, Eddie, he, Irishman uh, looked a little like Prince Harry and always said us Americans spend you know too much time with acronyms. Uh, uh, so, you know, I always try to define those as well. But, you know, when we look at history, a historical dental owner, you know, working four days a week, four and a half days a week, they were told the industry average was 62 to 82 percent of trailing 12 collections was their value. Mm -hmm. And in today's world, that would translate to two times EBITDA. Michael, what's EBITDA? 
earnings. Oh, you're asking the lawyer. Yes, earnings. I am. For interest, uh, taxes, depreciation, depreciation and amortization. Yeah, I was really asking my fellow Red Raider there. But, um, <laughs> well, you bet, you definitely shouldn't ask Brad. <laughs> I would have said whatever you say. Mike. Yes, exactly, exactly. But you know, now you're you're really normalizing everything from this context of EBITDA, and that's where telling the financial story, getting your financials and income statement defined, so the industry the way they look at it. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you translate what used to be a two to two and a half times EBITDA valuation and in, in industry norm. When we all first got into this industry, now it's more like a five or six at mm -hmm. that industry level. And there's a lot of aggressive activity and a lot of people that are interested in this. And, you know, for those listeners, the reason why, because I think that's the biggest conversation is the consistency of returns. And, you know, nobody really thought a global pandemic uh, would have tested the rebound or the resiliency of healthcare, but it certainly did. And I think even more so activity wise, that's why we've done so many transactions in the last few years. It really ramped up from that standpoint. It's a fair assessment. So when you're your advisor on the I'm gonna camp out on the DSO deals, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, what is a DSO if you as a good candidate? And I'm also just kind of relatedly curious, do you see a typical career stage where the dentists tend to sell to a DSO? Yeah, great question on that one. I think, you know, I'd love to be sitting here again in 24 months, and 48 months and and having the same conversation. Right, I think he's trying to book. Yeah, I book, book just, myself. I'm available. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think really when we start looking ahead, uh, you know, the cost of education is going up. The number of folks trying to go down that healthcare path. I mean, as we all age together here, uh, you have to be sit here and be concerned. So a lot of students, I remember speaking at the dental schools for years, and it would be like, who wants to own a practice? And 98% of the room would raise their hand. And that evolution as DSOs became more prominent, it went down to like 3 4% of the room was raising their hand yeah. because they, they wanted the security. They knew they had a lot of debt coming out of school. They knew they needed that. I'm not saying they weren't going to come to it later, yeah. but you know where the mindset is today, but what's making you know, DSO is attractive is, is that, right? It's giving the baby boomers this next transitional period, a great exit plan, a plan they would have probably never thought about at these valuations. And of course, it's getting those students some consistency and comfort coming out of school that they have a way to pay off their student loans at a higher rate than they would have made otherwise. Do they ever, and when you're in the, Michael and I've had the same experience when we go to the medical school and talk, it's kind of funny. We've, you know, as Michael alluded to earlier, we've been at long enough to, to see the shift of the room about who's going to practice and, our, and, our, and then who's going to go join a, a larger group or join the hospital system. But have they ever asked you, you know, from a dentist perspective, but why would I want to? Is there, you know, is what's the advantage of working for it? Um, you know, I, I get the question a little bit and it ultimately becomes personal preferences a lot of time. Like we all sit here as entrepreneurs and wanted to hang our shingle and it's not saying we well maybe it is saying we couldn't have worked for somebody but uh at the same time it was you know we have a vision and a passion to do something a little bit differently than others and we always say if you've seen one dso you've seen one dso <laughs> and there's a lot of truth to that because you are defining your own path yes dentistry is dentistry but um you know at the end of the day how you the patient walks in the door what their experience is the use of technology or not no technology you know, so you, you have that entrepreneurial spirit that, that you see. What it, What's really interesting, and I know you guys grew up a lot in the physician side, is physicians did this 10 years before dental. Mm -hmm. You know, so we saw the hospitals acquiring everybody. Yes. We saw the doctors exiting said mm -hmm. hospitals yes. uh, five, seven years after they had sold. And I think we're actually going to see the same thing in dental. And I, we're probably on the back end of that. We're actually, I'm sorry, the front end of that ex exercise as they've sold the DSOs and like, you know, I kind of miss being chair side on my own. Mm. And it'll be interesting to see that over the next five to seven years. So you mentioned that uh, some of these uh, kind of practice sales or, you know, have crept up into the five X ish EBITDA range. Talk a little bit about, you know, what are the KPIs that a DSO is looking for? And, you know, what are the kind of financial indicators that would, impact value that and for context what does kpi mean michael 
Um, well, I'm I'm going to let Mike answer that one. <laughs> so, I, yeah, we're all laughing here in the room. So, key performance indicators, and I I think you know as we talk about the sophistication of, of the industry, it's no longer just about the income statement or the PL, the profit and loss statement. It truly is getting to the KPIs, like key performance indicators, doctor days work, production per patient, number of patients seen, new to active patients, you know, collection ratio. And a lot of those same KPIs are, you know, resonate across multiple different healthcare verticals and specialties. But, you know, buyers today are looking at those trends, you know, especially with the emerging DSOs or emerging dental practice. So many of them are on a cash basis, meaning they're recording income as received, and they were uh, recording expenses as they pay them. Which is normal to the brain. It is normal to the brain. And we'll get in a whole other session in 12 months talking about GAP. So, <laughs> Riley, get that book. Um, but, you know, as we, we look at this industry, the, the amount of data that's available analytic-wise, it allows, you know, people and buyers to be more sophisticated and then also pay these higher multiples. And and I'm just going to show up, Brad, real fast and say that GAP means generally accepted accounting principles. Man, that's great. Good job. Do that's we, that's do a we, red We're going to just start jumping in and just using lots of accounting terms and see how many of our audience members start listening. Is that the, what you're trying to do here, Michael? <laughs> I, I'm just trying to define the acronyms <laughs> as they pop up. I, I can see the audience raising their hands left and right right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's and it's helpful because now we know, you know the kind of numbers they look for. So a deal starts launching. So Letter of intent's been signed, and then we, we, we call the due diligence phase, which is really the phase where you kind of, as Michael alluded to, you're opening up the underwear drawer, proving that, hey, this is what I said I'm worth, and this is how I can prove it. And, and, and as, you, as we go through this M&A process, what, when you are seeing, at least you know, in any of deals, you look at the medical side or dental side and your answer, what have you seen that says, okay, during due diligence, this is what happened, and this helped close the deal, versus this is what happened, and deal failed to close? Man, it's so such a great question because I've, I'm in the middle of experiencing both uh, mm -hmm. right now. And, and a lot of times it's numbers looked okay or we couldn't get our hands around numbers. You know, I've been doing a lot of this. I know we were talking about as I walked in the, the room. I, I do about 40 to 50 presentations a year. So I love education. I love these, these conversations. Um, but still to this day, I feel like I have so much work to do on the importance of the financial statement. And the reason I mean that, and I hope all the CPAs listening are cheering now, but the reason <laughs> we talk about this is it's devaluing yourself, right? I know there's a cost to getting good product and good financials and timely, but it also, you know, one $1,000 change of how something was coded or not coded, you know, if you multiply that at five or six, and then you do that month after month, now we're talking times 12, well, that's a $70,000 increase in valuation. We'll take that at 10,000, 15, 100,000, and now you're talking real significant change in valuation. So as we look at these deals and close, the ones that aren't closing, it's twofold. It's not just about the numbers. It's also about the, you know, just the culture. Is it a fit from a partnership standpoint? Um, you know, what we're seeing, is this the right partner, you know, from a due diligence standpoint? Sometimes the other thing that happens if a deal goes too long, and I know I saw uh, Skytail on here not too long ago. If a deal goes too long, you know, then you start getting deal fatigue and you start seeing the performance slip in those practices. And I had something like that happen recently where the deal just went on. They found they thought they found the right buyer and it just kept dragging on. They kept saying, well, let's just let's see three more months of activity. Let's see three more months. And operation teams distracted, you know, clinical provide, you know, providers are distracted and you start seeing that kind of stuff happen. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons a deal can blow up, but I, I think it, you know, it's important as we think about due diligence, you're not just being the one that's being evaluated. You need to evaluate that partner too. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think a lot of people, when they get that letter of intent and, and also they're moving to the definitive documents where they're moving forward, they, instead of getting, you know, they've been on the accelerator for so long, they kind of ease up and all of a sudden they look at the numbers and say, wait a second, you guys are all of a sudden, all the docs are going to Europe on these long cruises for 10, 15 days. And the numbers aren't adding up all of a sudden and they don't realize, yeah, you may be, you know, you might be sold, but you still have to act at the same way you were before. 
and a lot of times it's, you know, you guys talk legal um, all day, every day. And a lot of times it's, you know, simple things, the employment contracts, the doctor contracts aren't lined up mm -hmm. payroll taxes. There's a 1099 issue versus payroll from a, a clinician standpoint. And, and the buyer can't get comfortable with that, you know, what, how they structure their, uh, their own contracts. So there's a lot of reasons to, to be mindful and, and the intent isn't really to scare anybody, but at mm -hmm. the same time, make, make sure everybody's aware that, you know, invest in your practice, not only in what you're doing day to day chair side, but how you've built your systems, what story you're telling financially and, you know, culturally. And of course, from a legal standpoint, too. And I always say build your team, right? It's not just the lawyers and the accountants and the, you know, investment bankers and the, and the team. It's your wealth advisor, it's your personal insurance attorney, it's your, you know, a state attorney, all those folks that really are going to guide you through this process. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. So, uh, and before we sign off, Michael, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Mike, I'm gonna ask you a tough one here. So put your little hat on with ah. your, you know, the, the visor you have to wear. Like, uh, yeah. Um, in, in, I think maybe from my audience members, from your perspective as a CPA, what, what has been the biggest red flag you saw when you told the, the buyer you can't do it because of? Yeah. So a lot of these deals, great question. Um, a lot of these deals, when we think about how these deals are structured, I, if we don't, if we don't mind, I have a little time. So we always talk about 10 times EBITDA or right. 12 times EBITDA. The reality is it's most of the time four and a half to six times EBITDA of cash at close. Mm -hmm. And the reason, simple reason, is most lenders will only lend up to four times and a lot of these deals are debt financed. So when we look at the delta in that and you hear these valuations 18 times, 15 times, 20 times, it's the perception of the rolled equity. Mm -hmm. So when you're we're on the sell side and doing that due diligence of the buyer, it's like, what is the true value of that rolled equity? And you believe they will create that value on the, the back side. Again, it's due, doing due diligence of the buyer in that group as well. Or do we feel comfortable in the numbers? I've had, you know, one transaction last year. I remember you find out real quick, is it do they care about the culture and the built, you know, what you've built as a business and the team you've built? Or is it truly about the numbers? And every question that came to us, operations and the doctor, were all about numbers. Mm. And I said, guys, if they're doing this now, this is what your life will be like every single week, every single month, every single mm -hmm. year after close. Is that what you want? Or do you want a partner that's running alongside you? And I think those are important things to understand. It's not just about the numbers. It's fascinating. Yeah. Well, it flew by. That was awesome. And uh, we're... Mike, we're grateful that you joined us on the League of One, Two, Threes with Bertadotto. Uh, we are going to go on a break and let you go, and then we'll have a quick wrap-up with a couple of final legal thoughts. Thank you so much for having me. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team, so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back to Legal One Two Three Zero Dot. I'm your host Brad Dot, my co-host Michael Bird. Now, Michael, this season, where our theme is the Hitchhiker's Guide to M&A. Today, we had, you know, on this today's show, we had Mike White come join us, really do a deeper dive on the accounting side of M&A deals. So it was a lot of fun having him on. But one of the things he said near the end, which I thought was impactful, and I want to make sure our audience really was keeping up, was really talked about on equity roles. And I don't know if we've actually spent that much time, but is that sushi? Yes, it is. It's a delicious equity roll. And if you uh -huh. have a really good one, it tastes great, by the way. Uh -huh. But um, in reality, when you get the financial, when someone says, I'm going to buy you for $25 million or $10 million, whatever the magic number is, there's cash at closing. And then there's some earn outs. It means that after you hit certain thresholds, you get there. And you're going to get some shares in some entity in the future. And that entity hopefully will grow in value because it's going to acquire other things. And it will roll up later down where it gets bought by a bigger conglomerate. And that's typically when we're referencing the, the, those roles. And that's that's a very important part of DSOs and MSO deals. But I thought he brought up some other interesting aspects about on what side it, you're sitting on makes you do some more yeah. work. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you think about it, I mean, if you're getting using your analogy, this 25 million, and let's just say, for example, that you got 80% of it cash at close, or maybe there's some earnouts in there, yeah. your 20% is you getting shares in their MSO or DSO, so that's the equity role. And your outcome on this investment now depends on the performance of the buyer, mm -hmm. you know, in the next five years. And yet so many times our clients who are selling, when we say, you know, we need to do due diligence on the buyer, mm -hmm. there's like this light bulb moment of like, oh yeah, I guess we do. How do you do that? And Mike brought that up. Yeah. And, uh, and I actually uh, may have seen that in, in some prior episodes at least mentioned. And so the idea is just that, like you, you get this big due diligence checklist that we've talked about in prior episodes where you're opening your underwear drawer. Well, guess what? You can do the same thing as a seller. If you're going to be rolling and having some of the purchase price be an equity in the new company and ask them some of those questions, a little lighter, yeah. but, uh, but still fair game for you to, be eyes wide open. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all great points. Well, audience members, that's all the time we have today. But next Wednesday, we have season regular, our partner, Jay Riero, back well, as we go down this journey, the Hitchhiker's Guide of m &A, And we'll hear some more stories about some m &A mistakes and how to avoid them. Bird Adato is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bird Adato. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.